Hi, I'm Rick Kaler. Thanks for joining me. Are you concerned about the exploding national debt, which is brought on or certainly exacerbated by the $2.2 trillion CARES relief spending bill? And then the new $3 trillion spending bill just passed by the House? If so, you're in pretty good company. But, you know, the increase in the federal debt and the federal deficit might not be as dire as it first appears. And let me explain. Countries like the U.S., which issue currency, can't run out of their same currency, of the currency they print. In the case of the U.S., that's dollars. The central bank of the country, and in our case, that's the Federal Reserve, can create as much of it as the U.S. Treasury needs to meet its obligations. As long as goods, services, or obligations are priced in U.S. dollars, the supply of dollars to the U.S. Treasury which come from the Federal Reserve to buy those goods and services is unlimited. Now here's, here's where we get caught up. This isn't true of users of currency like you and me, corporations, cities, and states. Our outgo needs to match our income because we can't create dollars. Only the federal government can create dollars. Now this isn't true of countries um, like say members of the European U uh, Union that don't issue their own currency. So, um, because they can't print euros. So they very much, they're like states that can't print dollars. So the capacity of our government to create an unconstrained supply of dollars is a pretty new phenomenon. For many years, uh, under the gold standard, the value of U.S. currency was tied to the government's supply of gold held at repositories such as Fort Knox. Creating new dollars meant obtaining more gold. But all that changed in 1971 under President Nixon when our government decoupled the dollar from the gold standard. It became what's called a fiat currency. That's money that's used as a medium of, of exchange but has no intrinsic value. It can't be exchanged for silver or for gold like our money was, say, 100 years ago. Ever since that happened, the U.S. government has been able to create as many dollars as deemed necessary. The CARES Act essentially sent instructions to the Federal Reserve to create $2.2 trillion. How do they do that? They use a keyboard to print digital dollars called bank reserves. Although the government can't run out of money, it's not completely unrestrained. You're probably thinking, oh, wait a minute, okay, so we can just print all the money we want. There's something just doesn't sound right with that, and you're right. The biggest downside of creating currency is the risk of devaluing that currency through inflation. Think Argentina or uh, uh, World War II uh, Germany. Creating money, though, doesn't guarantee inflation. Uh, and, and how that works is that if the recipients of the newly created money don't spend it, it's not going to create inflation. And this is largely what we saw in 2008, 2009. Trillion, I think around $4 trillion was injected into the economy and there was no inflation. Why? Because banks and uh, people who received the money from the government didn't spend it. So inflation requires three components. 
too many dollars, chasing too few goods and services. And you've got to have all three. Too many dollars results when the federal government increases spending in one area without an offset like raising taxes or cutting spending elsewhere. That's called PAYGO, uh, which you, you hear referred to all the time out of Congress. If we're going to spend it here, we got to find it someplace else. Well, in this case, the $2.2 trillion wasn't found anywhere, right? There were no taxes increased. There were no uh, uh, cuts. So it was created. Too few goods and services means the country is running at full capacity. Everyone's employed, and we're creating as many goods and services as possible. So the chasing unites those two. Chasing means an increase in the demand for goods and services with no corresponding increase in the available amount of them. So prices then rise, creating inflation. Stephanie Kelton, professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and author of The Deficit Myth, discussed this issue in an interview on NPR's Marketplace. I would highly recommend listening to that. She explained that as a country, we are only capable of producing so much. There are limits to production and there's limits to supply. If spending is excessive, then there will be inflation. When the economy is at full employment and production, the goal then is to contain spending. To discourage spending, the Fed can raise interest rates and Congress can raise taxes and or cut spending. But when the country isn't running at full employment or production, as is the case today. More spending can put people back to work, producing more and increasing the supply of goods and services. During these times, increasing spending doesn't have the threat of increasing inflation. Kelton suggests that deficit is a poor term, pointing out that a federal deficit it's not like when you and I have a deficit. It means that the government is spending more into the economy than taking money out. And where are they getting the money to spend into the economy? They're creating it. The deficit is actually a financial contribution. So it's a financial contribution from the federal government. It becomes a surplus to the private sector of the economy. The government's red ink, she notes, is the private sector's black ink or um, surplus. So therefore, Kelton believes it's wrong to say the deficits we're incurring today will hamper us in the future. I know that's a lot. <laughs> it, it took me about 18 months of study to really get this. And it's pretty hard to do in about 600 words. So hopefully that will get you thinking, spur some more questions. Um, you can uh, get on and on YouTube and put in Stephanie Kelton and she has a number of, of uh, videos. And her most recent stuff I think is ex explaining it the best in the NPR. Um, interview it was really good it's a podcast okay thanks for listening